Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 film Don't Torture a Duckling. Uh, this is another Giallo film that I'm doing a review on. Uh, if you want to check it out on my channel, if you're into Giallo specifically, I have a whole playlist on there that is all the Giallo films that I've reviewed. Now, this will also be a part of my Lucio Fulci playlist that I have on there, which this will be my fifth movie adding to that. So I've actually gone on a, on a quick stint of watching all Fulci. Actually, um, I hadn't seen Fulci, and over the last two months now, I've watched five Fulci films, so... Uh, it's interesting. Plus, this is this one's interesting that I'm doing this one last because I did um, uh, City of the Living Dead, The Beyond, uh, The Cemetery by the House, Zombie, and now I'm doing Don't Tor Torture a Duckling last, which is very interesting because uh, the first four films I did came later in his career, and this one was much earlier. He was more known for Giallo and being less gory and you know, more geared towards like zombie and stuff like that. So it was interesting for me to see all those, those four first and then now see this one, which is what he was more known for uh, earlier in his career. So it's interesting. Uh, it's written and directed by Lucio Fulci. Like I said, uh, he did zombie cat in the brain city of the living dead, the beyond house by the cemetery, just to name a few. He's done a lot. Uh, also written by Roberto Gianviti who has 129 credits on IMDb, writing credits. Also, Gianfranco Clarisi, who has 66 writing credits on IMDb. Both of those guys mainly just have credits for, like, Italian language films. So um, that's why I didn't, you know, list specific films. Uh, this was the first film Fulci made with gore effects. So this is why this is an interesting one, because this kind of, like, marks where he starts his interest in doing gore and there really isn't a whole lot of gore to this um i mean there's a little bit especially in comparison to the other four films that i've watched of his where he really steps it up and those things really become a focal point of what he's going for but the interesting thing is between this film and the other ones you can see the same type of fulci structure in that uh the way he directs the way he likes his cinematography to go really good uh, shot framing, really good panning and camera movements, really interesting shots that he sets up uh, the way he constructs them. And also uh, another commonality is his pacing of scenes. Like he has a tendency to let scenes go a little bit too long, but that's, you know, just a thing that he does. Uh, the film had a hard time actually getting released outside of Italy because it's got criticism of the Roman Catholic Church in it. Um <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing with this, and I could see this being a big problem in the early 70s, is that the priest, well, hold on. Before I go any further, just know, much like all my old movie reviews, spoilers, all sorts of spoilers. So turn this off if you don't want to know spoilers for this film. Go watch it, then come back. So anyway, so the biggest thing is the priest in this is the killer in the end. So Roman Catholic Church obviously would not really like it, and people who love the Roman Catholic Church would just be like, Oh, you made the priest the killer. You know, back in the early 70s, stuff like that didn't play as well as it would nowadays. People would just be like, oh, it's a film, whatever. It's this person's take on it. Uh, so, so yeah, it had a hard time getting distribution outside of Italy because of how um, against the church it is. And it didn't actually end up making a de debut in the United States until 1999. And that was thanks to distributor Anchor Bay. So took a long time to get this film over in the States. Uh, the opening sequence in this film with the child's skeleton is actually a really attention-grabbing uh, scene. This is something I feel like Fulci does a lot in his films. He'll have, like, an opening sequence that has something that's just like, ooh, you want to know what's going to happen now. He doesn't, like, start it, like, super, super slow. He'll, he'll give you, like, an awesome grabbing scene, and then he'll back it down and kind of slow it down and then build it back up again. So he obviously does that in this film with the with the child skeleton. Uh, I do think that the music that went along with that opening scene was way too uh, in your face. It was like beating you over the head, trying to tell you what to do. Um, in general, the music in this was a little problematic. At certain times, it was great. It worked really well for, for the scene and what was going on. At other times, it was over the top or was totally mismatched. There were some real instances where it, it felt too fun loving and whimsical for what was actually going on so some overall musical issues in my opinion uh they established pretty quick that these kids are awful despite being active with the church 
Uh, that's important because obviously in the end, the reason these kids are getting killed off by the priest is because they're, you know, um, I guess sinning in a way. They're, they're becoming unpure. They're going down the path that the priest doesn't want to see them go down. So he kind of takes them out to like save their souls in a way um, while they're still young and haven't done too much terrible stuff. But they do a good job of setting that up. Because they show immediately that these kids, you know, they're very, very involved with the church at first. And then as soon as they leave the church, they go and they do terrible things. Like they're, you know, shooting animals with rocks. They're uh, trying to be peeping toms. They're trying to watch these women and, and men have sex in this place that they go to. And they're smoking. And it's just like all these things. And and they do a good job of just kind of laying that, that groundwork for what you're going to find out at the end of why the kids are being killed. And the other thing is like... Kid killing in film is controversial anyway. I mean, tr the film Trick or Treat, one of my favorite films, uh, in, it was done, it, it was finished up in 2007, it was ready to be released, but because it had a child death in it, a very prominent child death in it, actually a few child deaths, but one very prominent one they were worried about, it sat on the shelf for two years because they didn't know what to do with it. They were f fearful that people would... Ha that there would be a lot of backlash because of the child death in it. So it's just sat on the shelf for two years, and then it was eventually released straight to DVD at that point. So, um, I mean, even now, there, there's an issue with people, you know, going into the realm of child deaths. So, so for a film like this in the early 70s, I mean, to have so many child deaths in it, on top of the killer being a priest, I can see where this film was getting probably a lot of heat at that point and it's the, you know once again easy to see how it didn't get had a hard time getting distribution outside of italy so um the close-up shots of the dirty voodoo dolls in this is actually kind of disturbing the way it's shot because with the lighting and how like grimy and dirty they are and you're not seeing who's doing it uh they're focusing very very tightly on on the dolls themselves and the pins and like sticking the pins through like the throats and stuff Additionally, the noises that they have going on during that are really disturbing because it's like sounds of kids like in distress, like suffering. Um, so I thought they did a really good job of kind of having, you know, a rough, uh, rough, disturbing, uncomfortable scene there, which was good. I mean, it adds to the film what it's supposed to be. Um, the woman being sexual with the kid is not even close to believable. The, the rich woman who... <laughs> excuse me, who's kind of thrown out there as a bit of a red herring in this, who, you know, says she doesn't, like, feel connected to anyone. Uh, when the kid goes up to, like, bring her her orange aid, I think is what he calls it, or uh, he just sees her laying there naked, and she's just all, like, she's, like, it's almost like she's trying to seduce him, and then later on when she comes across the kid when she's got a flat tire, and she's like, oh, will you help me with my flat tire? What would you want? Do you want money, or would you like a kiss? Like, that stuff's not believable. So to make that character like sexual with these kids, I understand it was done to to create more of a red herring for to make people think, oh well, she obviously is the one doing it. Especially when they leave her lighter at the at the scene of the crime. Uh, I understand that's for misdirection, but it's not believable. It's very odd. I just don't. I don't like that aspect of it because it just doesn't play well for me personally. Some people may be like, "Oh yeah, I, I quite liked it." Like I understand why it's there. It's just very unbelievable and kind of dumb in my opinion. I like how the police police in this tell Bruno's parents that they're not even sure they can save the child when they haven't found the body yet, and he's just a missing person. The police are just like, "You know, I'm not even sure we'll be able to save him." And it was it was just like, "Oh wow, that that's." That's it's those ty types of police that they're just like, I mean, we'll do our job, but like we're not going to make you feel good about where this is going. We're just going to tell you right now, plan on your child being dead. And then if they're not, awesome surprise, you'll be happy then. It's, it's just kind of ridiculous. The lady from the very beginning that actually has the crazy eyes has the crazy eyes down very, very well. What What's her name? It's... um. Uh, I have it, Machara, that's right, I had it in my notes, Machara, uh, the woman who was practicing voodoo, who said she did kill the kids through voodoo, which obviously she didn't, um, well, I mean, some people could question that, you know, some people could say that the voodoo did work, and it overtook the priest, and he was doing these terrible things for that reason, but to me, it didn't play that way, but 
Um, she did an amazing job looking crazy. Her acting was very good. I thought she was one of my favorite parts of this film. Acting in general was pretty good, except the kids, pretty iffy. But that's, you know, that's par for the course. Kid actors are very iffy, usually. They do a good job of portraying mass hysteria in this when the, the initial red herring is arrested. The guy who they, just, the one guy calls a dimwit, the guy with uh, special needs in the in the neighborhood when they think that he's the killer because he had grabbed the money for the ransom um that i the hysteria that ensues after that when everyone knows that he's be, been arrested and it's just like this crazy mob mentality that just explodes and i felt like they did a really good job of capturing that not just that at that point but the same type of thing when machara is uh arrested and then she's eventually let go and she gets you know, brutally murdered, but I'll talk about that a little bit more <clears throat> later. It feels like a veiled confession to me when the priest was saying that the kids care more about soccer than they do about the Lord. He made a comment that was something like, um, the kids are close with the Lord, but they're more interested in soccer. It was something to that effect. And then he goes on in this conversation to say, that he's good at soccer and he play he really likes to play soccer. So I felt like the construction of, of that dialogue really was a hint at it, the priest being close with the Lord, but not as close, you know, because he was drawing this parallel with the kids saying, oh, you know, these kids are like, they're close with the Lord, but they're not actually like that interested in being good kids. And then he kind of puts himself in that same category. And I just thought that was a really interesting way that the dialogue <clears throat> excuse me was put in there sorry i'm still getting over <clears throat> still getting over the sickness it's just hanging on in my chest but i really honestly that was my favorite like um secretly foreshadowing moment in this film the voice acting of the kid being strangled in the rain terrible not convincing at all sounded so bad and so over the top and like comedic i laughed at it it was bad uh, some of those moments in this. Uh, when the mother freaks out in the church saying the killer is here, you need to rem to notice that as soon as, you, like, they're focusing on her and she's like, the killer is here, the killer is here, I know it. And then they pan back, they, they like, pull out and they pan over to the right. And as that's happening, the, you see the priest and he turns around and looks right at the camera. But then they keep going. And that's yet another one of those, you know, visual cues of, he's the killer because she's immediately saying he's in the church and then they show the priest turn around and yes he's the killer so yes he's in the church so uh a lot of people probably wouldn't catch that until a second viewing of the film knowing what the end is but that was interesting when i was taking notes what i did is just take notes on any time one of the characters like there was that type of interesting foreshadowing that it seemed like for one of the characters potentially being the killer and then just you know erase the notes that I don't need. So just letting you know. Um, I love how the old guy who lives with the, with Machara tells the police, excuse me, I got to go take a crap. First of all, he wasn't even that interested in talking to the police. He was very like whatever about things, but probably part of that being because he knows Machara wasn't guilty of anything really, but he was obviously making these voodoo dolls for her. I don't know if he believes in it or not. That wasn't a hundred percent, um, I get, well, I guess I guess he did believe in it because the the rich lady I forget what her name is in this she had been saying that she would go and talk to him I think his name was Francisco, and because she was into the occult and stuff and and it was interesting to talk to him and she didn't really connect with anyone else in the neighbor or in the uh, village so, but I just thought it was hilarious when at the end he was just like yeah excuse me I gotta go take a crap I'm like okay, um Machara's death okay when she finally gets released from jail. First of all, there's a there's a strong foreshadowing that she's going to be killed because that one police officer says, I would rather hold her because I don't want to get, I don't want other bad things to happen, basically. He alludes to the fact that he believes vigilante justice would happen to her, and that's exactly what happens. Now, her death scene is actually overly drawn out, in my opinion. It is pretty brutal, and that's fine because of the type of film it is, but I felt like it just took way too long. It took so, so, so long to do. But and one of the interesting things, too, during her death scene when she's getting beaten, like when the guy hits her with the chain, you can tell if you pay attention that like what they did for the shot is they like do a close up of the one guy like 
like using the chain and then it's a second it's a separate shot of they put they like laid laid it on her chest on her stomach and like had done all the uh, uh practical effects under it and then they just laid it on top of that and then for that shot they started it with just pulling it off so like it looks like he's whipping it and pulling it off with the way that they cut it but it's just it's just kind of interesting to see that stuff uh, the vacationing families driving by and seeing Machar dying on the roadside, but doing nothing is a clear condemnation of society itself. Just seeing something terrible happening, seeing this person dying on the roadside, literally, and doing nothing about it. Just seeing it, and then eyes forward, let's focus on what we're doing. Um, not our business, we don't care. You hear about stuff like that happening in real life from time to time where, you know, someone gets assaulted in a subway in New York or something and nobody does anything about it because that's not my business, that type of thing. And these types of things, especially in film, are usually thrown in there to be a condemnation of where we're going with society and how disconnected we are from one another and how we're not focusing enough on actual humanity. So I kind of feel like this was it, that this was particularly in it. Uh, for Fulci to show, hey, you know, society's kind of going to hell in a situation, uh, in a certain way. Um, oh, poor rich lady, I put down, complaining that people in the town don't understand her. Oh, yeah, they probably don't understand you because you live in an amazing house, which it does look amazing in this. And you have so much money, and it's obvious you do nothing. Like, she literally talks about how she just likes to just go out and just drive around. Just drive for no reason. Obviously, she's not working. She's not really doing much of anything because she's got so much cash, except trying to, like, quasi-seduce young boys. It's, I don't know. It's just weird. That's why no one understands you, because you're a pedophile. The repeated zooming in and heavy piano banging on the picture of the Donald Duckhead when they're, when they're kind of focusing on it in the newspaper kind of ridiculous like it, it's excessive it's another one of those moments of just going too far like with the music i was talking about early where they're like beating you over the head with it uh same thing they keep going back to it like duh, 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 duh. like doing it once i get it doing it twice okay after that you're just stop just come on you're you're overdoing it restraint it's a good thing sometimes well a lot of times the hint of the, the doll's head isn't that strong, which is good because it keeps you kind of guessing. You know, the whole idea that um, Malvina, I guess is her name, the, the girl who's like deaf um, and doesn't talk. They say deaf and dumb. Uh, the fact that she has like the, the dolls with the missing heads and they find a head at the scene of the crime, at two scenes of the crime. Uh, so that's supposed to indicate someone from her family, which indicates the mom first and then indicates the priest second. Uh, I thought that was good because it is a clue, but it's not a super strong clue where you'd be like, oh, yeah, I get it. So it does kind of keep things interesting until the very, very end. So I like that. Uh, the sequence of trying to get Malvina away from the priest is way, 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 way too long and drawn out. When he's going to go to kill her and then the journalist shows up and then the rich lady shows up, like that just, the, the how they stretch that out it's too much. And that's a, that's a thing that Fulci does a lot is he'll just let scenes go on way too long. They start to lose their impact because of that. And that's a clear um, instance of that where it just loses the impact because you're just like, okay, we've been doing this for quite a while. Let's be done with it. The slow motion of the priest falling off the cliff and his face just like gradually getting ripped off by the crags and the rocks sticking out is pretty over the top, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun gore effect. Uh, it was a little excessive, like, how long they did it. It didn't really look great. It looked okay, I guess, for that time. But um, it was pretty funny because it was over the top. And I think it's a pretty good payoff at the end. Um, the cinematography is quite good for this film. I uh, really like that. Lots of interesting angles and the framings for the scenes. I talked about that earlier, like, in the beginning of this video. That's the strongest thing about it is the way it looks, in my opinion. Uh, talked about the music being pretty mismatched at times, so that was a, a downfall of the film. Uh, they do a good job with the red herrings. Uh, it makes me think, actually, a lot about how current crime shows on TV actually probably owe a lot to Giallo films because Giallo films were big in the misdirection area. They would, they would put in so many red herring people. It just feels like if you watch crime shows now, like they have just taken a lot from Giallo. I mean, it's the same type of formula. And it's the same formula they use, like, every time now. 
it seems like the kids getting it because they've strayed too far from an innocent path is what I put down. Talking about this earlier, but yeah, they set it up very well in the beginning so that you understand in the end is that these kids are going down the wrong path. So the priest believes he's going to he's going to grab them up off that path end their lives and save their souls. So pretty messed up, pretty misguided, obviously. And um, yeah, it's interesting. You can see where this caused issues in Europe because a priest is literally killing kids. That's the last thing I put. I know I talked about that already, but, <laughs> but it bears repeating for this particular film. So anyway, um, interesting film. It's not my favorite Giallo film. It's actually toward the bottom of Giallo films I've seen. I'm actually working on a list of my ranking of all the Giallo films I've seen. I think I put it at the bottom. Currently, I think, what do I have at the top at the moment? Let me see. Uh, as Deep Red by Dario Argento. That's my favorite at the moment. But, um, all right. Well, let me let me real quick give my rating for this film. So, with uh, out of five stars, with half stars in play, I'm going to give it three and a half. I like it. It, it. There are problems with it, like I talked about, but there's some really good things about it, too. Mainly the way it looks. The story's interesting enough. Um, yeah, three and a half stars. I'm down with it. Uh, so, yeah, if there are any other Giallo films out there that people really think I should see or any Lucio Fulci films or Lucio Fulci Giallo, put some comments down there. Let's talk about it. Also, what were your thoughts on Don't Torture a Duckling? It's available on Shudder when I'm doing this review, so you can check it out there. Um, put some comments down there. Do me a quick favor. Hit that subscribe. That is the best way for you to repay me for this video or any video that I do. Subscribe. If you've already subscribed, give me a thumbs up so, you know you're so I know you're still watching I want to encourage me here, but thank you for checking this video out and until next time, keep it brutal.